So now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Darren Ford here. So <clears throat> for those of you who attended last year's Grow Summit, you'll remember Darren as personable, high energy, and an engaging speaker. So Darren has done everything from selling advertisement in the IT industry, uh, being a headmaster for a school in Bulgaria, and leading training and people development in the corporate world. He is the author of several books, including The Millennial Challenge, How to Unleash Today's Young Talent, and Three Plus Floor Equals Success. Darren believes because we spend over half our adult life at work, we must not only do our job well, but also enjoy doing that work. His presentations center on helping people find success and gratification in the daily work activities. So Darren is the owner, founder of Pro Consulting. He's been married for over three years, has three grown boys and one grandson. So if you guys will help me in giving a big floor welcome to Darren Ford. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Can we actually give a round of applause to Crystal, Laura, and John? Because they all three did a great job. Good job. And, and I want to, John, I, I appreciate that. I do want to make one small clarification. Uh, I do have three boys. They're 27, 25, 23, and one grandson. And I've been married for 30 years, not three years. So <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was important that I made that clarification. Okay, so, so thank No, it was good, though. It was good. My wife will be really surprised if I come home and I say, hey, we've been only married for three years. So yeah. So anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're right. Hey, raise your hand if you were here last time or if this is the first time you've heard me speak. Yeah, really? Right? Good. Most of, most of you got that. Yeah, raise your hand if you never raise your hand. All right? Uh, this is about as good as it's going to get, okay? So laugh now, right? Because it's going to be, uh, it'll otherwise be a long time. No, it's, it's truly an honor to be back here. Uh, and, and Lori, I mean, Crystal, you did a great job with, with your talk because... Really what she talked about, it flows very well with what we're going to do here. And as, as I talk to some people here, I realize that there are people who have been here for a long time. You know, I'm talking to people who have been here for 10 and 15 and 20 years, and that doesn't happen by accident. So what we're going to talk about today, I think, is an incredibly important topic. I, I speak a lot on, um, on a few different topics. I talk on leadership. I talk on corporate culture. I did write a book on millennials. I've got those three millennials. I've worked with millennials, so I wrote a book on millennials, which is really good. My wife says it's just because I'm immature. That's why it all worked out okay. But the, most, but the talk that, I'm, that we're going to gonna do today, that we actually started last time at the, at the summit, is, is probably the most important talk or presentation I've ever given. Um, considering where we are today in, as a society, uh, it's important that we figure out how we get along. And let's face it, we're not. So we've we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's start by just jumping in and watching this video. We're, we're born to care for one another. Um, we don't care what you look like. We don't care the color of your skin. We don't care how you talk. We don't care if you can talk. We don't care if you can do anything for us in return. We're simply born to care for one another. But somewhere along the way, we, we, we take a turn and we, and, we, and we walk away from our true nature. And we start, we start, rather than looking out for others, we start looking out for ourselves. Um, we stop listening and we start debating and we start judging. And I would say that today... Uh, not only uh, do we take a turn, but we're running as fast as we can from our true nature, really faster than we've ever done. Would you agree? I mean, I, I tell you, raise your hand. If you think that, that society is, is more rude today than ever, raise your hand. I mean, we all feel it. We all feel it. Uh, I could give you, this isn't a research-heavy presentation, but I could give you lots of research that proves that what we're feeling. For example, on this one, the, the amount of, of rudeness that we feel at least once a month has been going, in the corporate world, has been going up for the last 10 years. And so the reason this, por this topic is important is because the incivility that we're starting to, that, that we know that we feel in our politics, in, uh, in our social media, just in our world, that civility, that incivility is going to start creeping in more and more inside the four walls here if we're not careful. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next uh, 60 minutes or so, is how can we prevent that? How can we prevent that? Before we get into the, uh, uh, and it's a very simple uh, uh, solution, not simplistic. Jack Welch would always say, Jack Welch, who was the CEO of GE, he would always make the difference. He, you know, GE was a very complex organization, much like you guys. And he would always talk about, he, he loved simple solutions, and he would distinct, distinguish between simplistic and simple. What we're going to talk about today is very, very simple. 
Not always easy to implement, but it's a simple concept to, to understand. So how did we get here is one question. I think the bigger question, though, is how do we get back there? How do we get back to the point where we're, we're caring for one another and we're kissing boo-boos? We need to. We need to get back there. So the first part of our presentation today, we're going to talk about this thing, in this, this idea of incivility. What is it? I mean, we kind of know what it is, but I want to make sure that we truly understand what is it. What do we do? Do we recognize it? Uh, what, what, are the, um, what are the outcomes of having incivility hit here? So we're going to look at, uh, I have some quotes throughout the day. Uh, we're going to look at some videos. So here's the first one. Watch this first video, which is an example of incivility. I have a question about the shareholder meeting. Uh, sure, just send me an email. But you're sitting right next to me. Well, just because we're on an airplane doesn't mean we change the way we do business. Just send me an email. Okay. Oh. Another email from that suck up Brian about the shareholders meeting. Watch this. Till Oh. <laughs> now, it's a really good thing that AirTran is out of business, because then I couldn't use that clip, right? And so... Uh, they, I actually, they, you know, they're owned by Southwest. I don't know if Southwest would, I probably should check with them. They may not be happy that I'm doing it, but that was a long time ago. But obviously that is, that is, that is fictitious, but it, it's a good example of what could incivility in our corporate world look like. Here's a real example that I pulled off of uh, YouTube. Watch this. Every time you're with a customer and there's some things I hear I do not like because you think you know everything and you don't know half of what you think you know that I have to suffer for. Guys, uh, yeah. So get with the program. It's not the best clip in the world, but when you go onto YouTube trying to find examples of incivility, it's hard to find one that I can use in a corporate setting. <laughs> it really, I mean, they're either too violent or the language just isn't good. But this is a pretty good example of what incivility at work could look like. I don't know if you heard all that, but there was, it, it appears to me that that was either a customer or, a, or maybe an employee who was trying to take a video of a boss berating an employee. And he said, you know, something, you, you, you think you know everything, but you don't know half of what you think you do. You know, and get with the program. And, and, so, and that was done in a public setting. I don't, you know, either those were all employees or, or it could have been those were customers there. Right? Incivility is really, it's, that's what I mean. If we're not careful, we're going to let this idea of what we say to people get out of control and it's going to impact our business here. And by the way, add this in there. Add technology, and it gets much worse. We say things to people, or, or I'm sorry, we tweet things about people or to people, or we write things that we would never do to them face to face. Look at this example. Um, I tell you what, before this, what do you think about, um, let's do this. At your time, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want you to talk about what is incivility at your table. 30 seconds, and then we're going to come back as a larger group and talk about it. So 30 seconds, when you hear incivility, at work, how does that work itself out? Go, 30 seconds. That's <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, one and a half, one. Okay, so now I, I need to hear a couple of examples you've got. And in order to do that, uh, let's see, let's do this. Um, every table needs to elect a CEO. If you've never had a chance to be CEO, now is your chance. Every table. So it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be hard for you too. So I tell you what, do, let's do this. Everybody, I've already lost control. Everybody, put your, put your fingers in the air. Everybody, everybody, fingers in the air. Point straight up. Point straight up. Everybody means everybody. On the count of three, point to somebody. One, two, three. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, so now, wait a minute. Everybody, every, every table, what would you guys do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a tough one on this one, yeah. 
So every table should have a CEO, and so this is what we're going to do. I need to hear, I'm not going to go to every table, uh, but I need to hear a couple of examples. So the CEO, you now, as a CEO, you can appoint a spokesperson for your table, okay? <laughs> so now, that's what CEOs do. CEOs make decisions. So CEO, pick somebody at your table who's going to speak for the table, okay? All right. So uh, let's start. Who's up? You guys have to, who's your spokesperson? Okay. What? Give me an example of incivility. Uh, we talked about mean, trying to hurt each other's feelings. Mean, hurting feelings. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, how about the table back in the back? We talked about lack of respect for an individual and being inconsiderate to your co-workers. Inconsiderate with coworkers. Absolutely. One more. Empathy. No empathy or lack of empathy. Absolutely. All good examples of of incivility. And it can be, again, it, it could be a lot of things. It can be what we just saw. It could be that berating. It could be a, a boss or even a coworker yelling at an employee. You know, at, I say at best, at best in private, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, it's even worse when it's in a, in a public setting or in a team setting. It could be, uh, refu you know, not, not wanting to listen, refusing to engage. Uh, it can be inviting the whole team out except for that one person on the team to lunch or to happy hour. It can be uh, outright bullying or outright, you know, conflict. It can be uh, passive aggressive. It can be, you know, dishonesty. It, it takes a lot of forms. Incivility basically is anything that uh, is is used to intimidate people or or really just make people feel uncomfortable, right? There's there's different degrees of it. Um, here's what I meant about technology. Here's a, a tweet by Tom Peters. We're going to hear from Tom Peters a couple of times today. Tom Peters is arguably, well, not arguably, he was. He was voted one of the top 50, I think it was 50 management minds of all time. He wrote a book, several books. One's called In Search of Excellence, one of my favorite books. He makes an amazing quote. He says, my greatest goal in life is to be plagiarized without any credit. Right, what an amazing thought, especially today when, when you know, we, we, we're sure, we, we try to hold on to all of our, our property and lawyers get, oh, yeah, my filter, I try to, are, 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 you, are you legal? No. Oh. <laughs> are there any legal lawyers in here? Any legals? Legal? Okay, then we can talk about them. So, um, but, but an amazing thought, right? I mean, Tom Peter says, look, I, I, if it helps you, if it helps your company, use it. I don't care if I get credit for it. And a gentleman by the name of Chris Gotts, he gets online, he goes, hey, how about learning how to spell plagiarism? <laughs> really? To, to one of the most influential management minds in the world, and I, and I just, I don't think he would have said that to him personally. Now, we don't know the, the spirit behind that. We don't know the attitude that he did that. But if he really cared about Tom Peters as a person, he could have sent him a direct message outside of the public view where I couldn't pull it out for a presentation. And he could say, hey, dude, you, you, you misspelled the word. Now, Tom Peters is very, very gracious in that he says, oh, my gosh, I did it a second time. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. I was really, I was really embarrassed. Now, as, as incivility goes, is this, is this a horrible example? No, it's not. But it is, I think, just another one of those constants drip, drip, drip of, of, of what we're going through in the world today. Here's another one. Again, I understand it's hard to see, but, but uh, it's an art. Don't get hung up on, on, on the, the content of the article. It's an article that the New Yorker magazine wrote. And it's about President Trump and, and Air Force One and how Ivanka likes to take that plane. Whether you agree with that, the political commentary or not, that's not the point. The point is this. When New Yorker writes that article, um, a lady named Liz Ryan, she tweets it out with her little comment, you know, classic. But look who tweet, retweets it. An organization called letskeepitcivil.org retweeted it. I mean, that's how bad it is today. That an organization that's dedicated to civility actually is adding to the incivility. Uh, now, a couple of points here that I, uh, I want to park for just a second. First of all, is, is, is I love that organization. If you're on Twitter or if you're looking for some, some ideas about uh, civility and, and how, we can, how we can have that here, uh, go check out letskeepacivil.org. They do a great job. I mean, they really are committed to civility. It, they, they do kind of make their political feelings known, and I wince when they do that a little bit. I wish they wouldn't, and it's not that they do it. It's just how they do it. So 
I went a little bit, but overall it's a really good organization. Here's the bigger point though. Uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to touch on, for the next few minutes, we may touch on some pretty sensitive topics. Um, we may touch on politics. I know we're going to touch on race. We may touch on gender. We may touch on generations. And it's going to be uncomfortable. But that's okay. If we're ever going to get on the other side of comfortable, or to, to get to that comfortable <laughs> side, we have to push through this. We're going to use race and we're going to use gender as props to help us carry on our conversation. And if we're not careful, we get stuck on the wrong things. For example, I just said that we're going to use race or gender as a prop. And somebody could say, really, something as sensitive and something as important as race and gender and you're going to use it as a prop? That's not the point. The point is the words are important. Yet, don't get me wrong. I, words are very important. And we need to choose them carefully. But more important than that, we need to understand the attitude, the hearts, and the meanings behind some things that people say. Does that make sense? So there's going to be some times when we're going to laugh. I'm a funny guy. I'm a really funny. I'm the funniest person I know. And there's going to be some times when there's going to be some times when it's really quiet here, and it's going to be uncomfortable. But that's okay. Can, so can we agree for the next 45 or 50 minutes that inside these walls we can be uncomfortable? Because I have a feeling, I, I'm confident that when we walk out of here, we're going to be just a little bit more comfortable with these discussions. Okay? That's my commitment to you. I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. Sticking in this idea about incivility a little bit more, there's another organization called ELI Inc. Any, uh, any training, any learning and development people here? Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of ELI Inc., but they're a great organization, and they, they are dedicated also to civility. And they've got a couple of training programs called Civil Treatment for Leaders and Civil Treatment for Employees. So if you ever wanted to really dive into this idea of civility and how does it play out here, uh, there'd be a great organization to look at. They have what they call an incivility triangle. And they break out levels of incivility. So at the lowest level, it's just uh, it's rude behavior. Rude, unprofessional. Um, Kind of like that, you know, really learn how to play, do, play, you know, spell plagiarize. Uh, it's, it's not horrible as, as, as incivility goes, but it is, that's the most pervasive. That's what we've seen the most of is, is that rude, unprofessional behavior. Right above that, it's unwelcome, unjust. Basically, that's just the first level kind of magnified and done over and over and over. All right, your rudeness, you know something, I can put up with it every once in a while, but every single morning you're, you're in the cube next to me and you're rude. I just can't take it anymore. You go above that, then you get, it's, it's worse. It's, you don't see it as much, but, it, but it's worse. It's outright bullying. And then finally, at the very top of the triangle, it's, it's the illegal stuff. So that's going to be sexual harassment. It's going to be hostile work environment. Interestingly, uh, uh, that the first three squares aren't illegal. It's not until we get to that very, very top that it's illegal and our, and our lawyer friends help us out there. Um, now, that, that those, some of those things below there might get you fired. You may not be working here, but they're not illegal. We, but all of this we need to make, and, and, and the low-hanging the low fruit, the rude and unprofessional, that's the stuff that's the most insidious. That happens a lot, and we need to make sure that we're guarding against that. Uh, there's a maybe back up. There's a video. This is the president of ELI. He's going to talk a little bit about this idea of incivility and, and how bad. It is. And that's why it's critical to build a civil treatment workplace. Are you serious? Now it's personal. I mean, I'm sitting there on the operating table, and my vital signs start to go south, and the anesthesiologist doesn't want to say anything because he doesn't want to get yelled at. Right? That's, that's an extreme case, I understand. But if you're the person on that operating table, it's serious. That's why if we allow that, that low-hanging, bottom-of-the-pyramid type behavior get by and it starts to it creep up, it could impact us in a very, in this case, a very deadly way. There's also this idea, I want one more idea about this idea of incivility and rudeness. It's contagious. The Wall Street Journal wrote an article and they said rude behavior is as contagious as the common cold. So listen to this, this idea about contagiousness. So rude colored glasses is this idea that depending on things that have happened to me before, I may perceive future incidents in a different way. So it's basically my tendency to, if I have previously experienced rudeness, to see things n later as more rude. So if somebody's rude to me in the morning, then at 10.30, later on in the day, 
I have an interaction with somebody, I'm more likely to interpret their, that interaction as rude as well, particularly if that interaction is ambiguous. So if somebody were to say to me, hey, nice shoes. Again, nice shoes is an ambiguous thing, right? I don't know if you're making a joke about my shoes or if you're giving me a compliment about my shoes. And rude colored glasses is, a, is this idea that depending on my cognitive frame, I may actually have the, this, the, this perceptual idea that this perceptual tendency to lean towards the rude interpretation. So if somebody's rude to me early in the morning and then you say nice shoes, I'm more likely to interpret that as rude than if, than if I had not had that earlier rude interaction. So what we're seeing is that prior interactions can give us these rude colored glasses that color our interactions throughout the rest of the day. So particularly in ambiguous situations where benefit of the doubt is important. Time of day matters for the rude colored glasses phenomenon because the earlier you experience that first interaction, the longer it has to play out through your workday. So the more interactions, it just, it's just a function of time and, and volume. So if I experience uh, my first rude encounter at 5 o'clock, well, I'm almost done. So there's not very many interactions for that, for that perceptual frame to influence. But if I experience it early in the morning, it has the whole day to play out. So it's bad. It's contagious. Um, and look at, the, look at what comes out of uncivil behavior, incivility. Decreased efficiency, low morale, reputation da damage. People find out that, that we're a rude, a rude company in the workforce. It can be hard to find more workers to come join us. Uh, bad engagement, distrust, turnover, and again, lawsuits at the very high level. You know, I, when I teach communication, one of the things I talk about is this idea of staying away from, the, from absolutes. Words like everything and always and never. But I think for incivility, this is one of those times when an absolute is, is, is appropriate to use. There is nothing good that can come from uncivil behavior. Nothing. So the question becomes this. Why do we let it, why do we let it happen? Any ideas? D discuss that at your, again, I'll give you 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. At your table, why would anybody, why would any company put up with any of this behavior knowing that these are the outcomes? Why does that happen? 30 seconds at your table. You have something? Who's your spokesperson? What, why, would, why would a company let some of this behavior go on? Fear of retribution, right. I don't want to call anything out because I want to be part of a team. I might get in trouble myself. And there are laws against retaliation. Let's understand that. But yeah, that could be a reason. What else? Back. Yeah, so, so it might be a management style that we, let, that we let get by. But again, I would say that we can actually help get by. There's management styles that are better than, than bullying and abusive and, and demanding. But, but that could be. One more. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. They don't want to get involved. Absolutely. You know, the other one that kind of comes up a lot is that it's, it's a key contributor. If in sales, it might be what they would call a rainmaker, the person who's got really good in sales. I'll never forget, I was, doing a, um, I was working with an organization and I was doing some management training. And this happened to be a first time management class. And, and so the very beginning of the class, we, we, you know, we went around and we introduced ourselves. And I say, say your name and, and what you've done. And what are you looking forward to most about being a manager, a people manager? And one of the guys walked up and he goes, you know, I forget what his name was, but he goes, I don't want to be a manager, but they're making me. And this was in the, within the first five minutes of the class. So I thought, OK, this is going to be interesting. Halfway, and this was a day-long class. And so right after lunch, a little bit after lunch, he came up to me and he goes, hey, look, uh, this, it's nothing against you. Good content. You're really good. But I just can't take it anymore. And he goes, I I'm going to leave. And he packed up his stuff, and he left. I mean, I thought it was so egregious, that, that behavior. I mean, I, and look, I've done this for a long time. I'm used to, I, I, I'm, I, don't heckle me, but I, I can handle it if you do, OK? <laughs> But don't. No, and, I, and, 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 and people not engaging. And not, but, but this behavior was really bad. So I went up to the manager. And, uh, and he, was, he, was, uh, he was in IT. And I said, this is what I feel like I'm in junior high, but this is what happened. And he goes, yeah, he's crusty, but he's brilliant. And we need him. So crusty really wasn't the word I would have chosen for him. <laughs> but now six months later, he, was, he ended up being let go. 
because his behavior didn't stop there. It was so bad, the team was under revolt, and it was either lose the team or lose him. And so he, he, got, he got let go. I do want to clarify something. Even though on, that, on, this, on this triangle, you know, I said that at the very top, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so, uh, but I stayed a Holiday Inn once, and so I can play one. That, okay, sometimes I'm going to say something that's funny. <laughs> and if you laugh, it would be good. And sometimes I'm going to say something that you know I meant to be funny, but it wasn't. If you'll laugh anyway, it's going to be good for all of us, okay? Um, so only that top is, is illegal when you get into sexual harassment and, and hostile work environment, right? But let's be clear, you do this, and I said below, those bottom three points are not illegal, but let's be very, very clear. If you do those things enough, if you're rude enough, and you do unwelcome behavior enough, you fall into that. Those individual behaviors might not be illegal, but you end up falling up all, or going all the way to the top to a hostile work environment, right? If you're a team leader and you're acting that way with your team, you're going to find yourself in a lawsuit of, of having a hostile work environment. So even though those bottom ones aren't illegal in and of themselves, they can lead to illegal or uh, to illegal to lawsuits. Okay, make sure I'm going to make sure I made that clarification. So what's the cost? I want to uh, one one last point, and then we're going to move on to how do we avoid all of this. But I want to make sure they understand there's a huge cost to, to this idea of uncivility. Now there's I haven't found any research that talks about the cost of uh, uh, incivility or an uncivil workplace. But I do know that there is a lot of research done on just this idea of, un of, of disengaged employees or, or un unengaged employees. And, and I think un incivility is a, is a major contributor. I mean, a lot goes into it, you know, a bad boss, low pay, uh, whatever. But incivility and just rude behavior and not liking the people you're working with is a big contributor to this idea of, of disengaged employees. Some of you may have heard this. Gallup has done a study, the, the big fir firm Gallup, and they've done it for 10 years, and sadly the numbers have stayed about the same. And they say this. That 30% of are engaged, and those are the employees that are they're, they're going the extra mile, they're giving the extra effort, they're, they're doing their best every single day, 30%. We have 50% of our employees that are, are, are they're not unengaged, but they're not disengaged. They're just, they're just there showing up every day. Now, some of those would be what we would call, you know, the people who show up every day, and we need the people who, I, we would know them as steady eddies, right? Or steady... Uh, just to be fair, since this is grow, steady, Stacy, I guess, I don't know, something like, right? Right, so, yeah? Steady Betty. steady Betty, okay, there we go, yeah, all right, okay, that's a good one. So, uh, and so we need some people like that, but then there are people who just show up and they're trading hours for dollars. And they're not doing anything to help, I mean, they're getting a paycheck, but that's all they're doing, is getting a paycheck. That's 50%. And then there's 20% of our employees who are actively disengaged. And they're the ones who, if you're, if you're a leader in here, they're the ones who are making your life, your management life harder. They're toxic to the team. They're certainly not a brand ambassador for us outside these four walls. So think about that. 20% or so, if you're a leader and you've got five people on your team, I'm just saying, right? So Gallup has done some, some research. They said, okay, what's the cost of those unengaged, those, those actively disengaged employees? And they found out that 34% of your salary or of that, of that engage, disengaged employee salary is a waste. It's costing that organization 34, for ten, every $10,000, $3,400. Now this is a fictitious company. I just did the math. Let's say we have a company of 5,000 employees. And I know, you, I know we're much bigger here, but you could do the math. You could apply the same kind of statistics. 20% of 5,000 is 1,000 employees. And let's say this company had a median salary of $60,000. 34% of that is $20,400 per employee. Do the math. 1,000 employees, 20,000 per employee. Actively disengaged employees is costing this company $20 million a year. So there's a lot of cost as far as low morale, turnover, but it's also a very financial point of it's costing real dollars. What if we could take 10% of those actively disengaged and move them up, not all the way to, act, to, to engage, but just move them up one section? Financially, it's a big benefit for, for an organization. Does that make sense? I want to, again, I, we could go on, and I, but I think hopefully I've made the point, incivility is costing us a lot. It's a real problem, and, and, it, and it's getting worse. We started out earlier by saying it's, it's, we feel it outside these walls, and if we're not careful, uh, it's going to start impacting us every single day. And because we spend over half of our awake adult life at work, we have to do what we do well, 
but we've got to enjoy it too. We've got to enjoy getting up in the morning and, and doing the work with the people that we work with. So what's the answer? I think there's one skill uh, that we can implement. Again, it's very simple, like I said earlier, and it's valuing others. I thought you did a great job, and I think that you have a culture here. In fact, you should probably give the rest of the presentation. No? No, but you, but you did. I love some of the things that you said about helping people, bringing people in. The, the, the steps that you laid out were, were really good, and that's the idea of building a culture where people are valued. I, I wrote about that in one of the books I wrote called 3 Plus 4 Equals Success. It's the three skills that you need for success, and there's, uh, there's three skills and four mindsets. And the three skills are critical thinking, effective communication, and valuing people which I've been challenged on, is that a skill? I believe it is a skill. I believe it can be learned. I think it can be practiced and improved upon, which is what we'll talk about for the rest of our time. If you do those three things well, you'll be successful. If you marry on top of that four uh, mindsets, and I put them in the form of a question, and the answer is yes for each one, you'll, you'll supercharge your success. The questions are this. Um, am I willing to be a continuous learner? Am I willing to work hard? Am I willing to work hard? And, yes, thank you very much, that was awesome, yes, yeah. I didn't have to wait very long for that one, so that's good. No, it's, look, come to work, you know, communicate well, think well, value the people that you work with. Be willing to learn something new and do your best every day. If you do those things, you can't help but be successful. But why is it so hard, that valuing people thing, why is it so hard? It's because we're different. We have, we're, 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 we're old, we're young, we're black, we're white, we're male, we're female. And those are just the outward characteristics, right? There's so many internal characteristics as well. When I was here last time, we went through this little bit of an exercise and we, I had everybody kind of measure themselves and, and you rated me on a couple of scales, loud and quiet. And so for... If you, don't, if you weren't here last time, let's go ahead and do this. Rate me. I, would you put me on the loud side or quiet side? Okay, that was really hurtful. <laughs> uh, not only, I expected one or two, but not the whole room. I mean, really. But no, it's true. I'm, I'm really on the loud side. Um, funny or serious? Funniest person I know. Uh, thank you for agreeing with me. I appreciate that. It, would anybody rate the, raise your hand if you say that you are uh, quiet and serious? Anybody? Uh, you put your hand up first. Yep. Oh, the person behind you. The person. You're in the middle. Okay. Yes. But how about, how about you? I, she's like, oh wait a minute, he's, he's picking on me. I don't know. I'm loud. I'm loud. What are what are what are you? You said you're quiet and serious. Okay. Okay. What's your name? Yvonne. Um. Yvonne, you know what drives me crazy? You do. Oh, my gosh. Yes, she drives me crazy. Right? I like to talk. You never talk. You don't banter with me. You might have fun, but, but, not, but not in my style of fun, right? And, and by the way, you never laugh at my jokes. And we've established I'm a funny guy. Okay? So, I mean, let me ask you a question. What drives you crazy? You can say it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. She was trying to be very nice. Well, you know, loud and funny people. No, yeah, I do. I drive you crazy. Because you're saying, well, I can't, I can't talk because I can't get a word in edgewise. And by the way, you're not as funny as you think you are. <laughs> but here's the point. We make each other better. I'm not saying that we're going to be BFFs and we're going to get together on Facebook and go on vacations together. But at work, we're going to make each other better. We complement each other. right? I need her to sit there and kind of tap me on the arm and say, hey, let somebody else talk. You know, or now's the time to be serious. And, but Yvonne needs me too. She needs me to say, hey, Yvonne, we've heard from everybody else on the team, but we haven't heard of you, and your opinion's important, so what do you think? But that makes it difficult. And those are just two. I mean, there's all, I, let's do this. We're going to do this very, I'm going to do a couple of them just for time's sake. We could do a whole lot more. But I, at your table, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a couple of pairs of words. And I want you, and when I say, are you this, I want you to raise your hand and look around at your table, and some of you are going to have your hands raised, and some of you aren't. Does it make sense? So look at yourself. So if you are, if you consider yourself like more of a scientific person, you know, facts and figures as opposed to artistic, raise your hand. Now the tables, look around your tables. You can see some people have their hands up. And everybody whose hand is not up means that they're on the artistic. Now, now granted, you may be, you may be somewhere in the middle, right? It's not, you're not always an extreme. 
Some people are, that's a continuum. Um, but, but we tend to lean, I mean, there's some people who could say, no, I am right in the middle, and that's true. But we, most of us tend to lean kind of one side or the other. Okay? Here's do another one. Uh, morning or night? Raise your hand if you're a morning person. Okay. Now, you morning, you morning people, look at your night people. Morning people, look at the night people. I'm just telling you right, if you haven't figured it out already, don't talk to them until noon, okay? They don't want to engage with you. They don't want, they don't want to talk with you. They want to have their four or five cups of coffee before they start talking, okay? But, it, but, but if you're that morning person and somebody comes in and you say, hey, how you doing? Hey, we're going to have fun today. Let's do some work. You're, they're like, okay, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> right? Um, you know, there's, again, we'll move on, but you get the idea. There's competitive and, 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 you know, my wife won't play games with me because I don't know why you would play a game without winning. <laughs> right? I mean, I take my t every single move I agonize over because I want it to be the best move and she's, and, and then when I lose, I'm, I'm not the best loser, okay? So she just doesn't like to play games with me. Um, how do you make decisions? You know, some people pull, do, do kind of a gut feel. Some people analyze things. You know, for us gut feel people, the people who analyze can drive us crazy. We're like, come on, let's make a decision. Um, change, routine. Some people like change. Some people like routine. Uh, Here's one. Be, uh, raise your hands on this one. If you are the type of person who, I'm not going to call them a perfectionist, although it's probably close to that, but if you just like to have either a project or a PowerPoint or something before you show anybody, if you want it to be 100% accurate, it's done, raise your hand. As opposed to us 80% people, I'm like, I, you know, I maybe get 80% there and I'll work on that last 20%. It'll be a group effort, right? <laughs> So I do that sometimes. And then uh, last one, how do you get your energy? You could almost say this is an introvert, extrovert thing. Do you get your energy by being alone, reading a book by yourself? Or, do you, or when you're tired, do you say, I need some more energy. I'm going to go to a party. <laughs> right? And that's how, that's, that's how people, social people, get their energy is by being around other people. All of the, and there's more. I just picked out a handful. But, but did you see at your tables how you raised your, we're all different. And some people, would, some people matched on certain characteristics, and some people were opposite on other characteristics. That's why it's so hard to value people, because we're all different. So, and, but although, let's face it, some people, are, some people are just genuinely hard to value. I understand that. <laughs> Don't go bumping anybody on the side or pointing at anybody, okay? That's not, that's not the point here. But everybody has, has value, and that's we're going to talk about that. I'm not going to get into it. Again, I could show you more research. This isn't a research-heavy presentation, but there's all kinds of research that says valuing people and building a culture that are, where people are valued has tremendous payoff. Um, companies who are public companies, their stock is higher than the market average and certainly higher than companies that don't have an engaging culture. Um, employees, are, they are, you tend to have more of those engaged employees. Uh, customer service is higher. Turnover is lower. Creativity is higher. Innovation is higher. Agility is higher. Here's one of those times when, again, you can use an absolute. Nothing bad can come from a culture that that's values people. And that's an engaging culture. I truly don't understand why, not, why every single company doesn't get on board with this idea. Because the research is clear. Companies who take the deliberate steps to build a culture where people are valued and where people are engaged, they outperform companies that don't. It's, it, there's no debate, but yet some companies don't. Some companies don't. And that's, that's a discussion for another day. There's a good, if you uh, want a really good book, this guy named Michael Stollard wrote a book called Connection Culture, and he has some training and uh, got a good blog, and he talks about this idea of connecting people. He takes a little bit of a spin of saying not valuing people, but connecting people. And today, there's, you know, there's, I don't know if you've read, but there's, there's an epidemic of loneliness. We're more, because of this, we're more connected together than ever. And yet, we're lonelier than ever. And he says this. He has an interesting quote. He says, wise leaders know that applying human value in the work culture can make a world of difference by firing up people, ultimately affecting their own success or failure as leaders. 
So if you're a leader, it's a good thing to do. It helps us personally. Now, we don't want to do it because of that. Our, it, it'll, we'll, people will find out that you're, that you're not genuine. At some point, you'll get caught and your true colors will come out. But it is a great byproduct. If you're a leader and you do this thing to, to, to build a culture that values other, it's not only good for the people in that culture, but it's good for you as the leader. It will help you in your career. Again, I don't know why more people don't, my companies and individuals don't do that. So, how do we do it? How do you build that? Some people are naturally better at it. Some people are pretty good at valuing others. Others need some more help. And so I'm gonna, there's five steps that I think that we can do. If you do, if you do all five or do some of them, I think it'll, it will build, if we're, we're deliberate, it will build a culture here where people are valued, or it might just be our own personal ethos, our own personal you know, team leader, or just individual as we go throughout life, value people muscles. And I'm going to list all five of them, and then we're going to go into them, uh, each one of them a little bit deep, uh, deeper. One of them is just uh, viewing people as important. It starts with this idea of just saying, you know something, there's value in people, period. End of story. Next is, is assisting in small ways, looking for ways where you can help other people. Next is listening. And, and, and not just listening on a scale of 1 to 10, although that's important, you want to be a good listener, but listening with this idea of being influenced. Next is understanding where we're similar. Because when if we understand how we're, how, there's more that binds us than separates us. And if we understand how we're similar, we can have the discussions, those hard discussions that we need to have. And then finally, explain. Tell people. I wanted to use tell, but I, it didn't make the word that I wanted, and so I had to use E and... So it's explain to people why they're valued, why you value them. That's going to, by the way, each one of these is, is, is a hours, half day, some of them an entire day presentation. And we don't have time to do that, so we're just going to go through them very quickly. The point of today's presentation, you know, again, it's not research heavy. Um, it's not really, I mean, we've laughed a few times, and we'll probably laugh a few more times, but it's not really designed to be a funny presentation. It's a presentation where you can walk out this door today, and I'm going to give you some practical steps where you can start building Though your personal value others muscles, and you can do it as a on your teams, and you can do it as an or as an entire organization. I, again, by what I can tell, I think you guys are already really good at that, but we can always get better. And then the other point of this presentation is just to make us think: How do we treat other people, both here at work and outside at work? So let's let's go into each one of them. First one, that's my mom, and this is the one that I kind of went into last time. And so raise your hand if you were here last time for the summit. Okay, so this, this story will sound familiar. I'll, I'll go into a little bit more since some of you weren't here. That's my mom, Gloria Ford. Um, she passed away in 2017. Lives up in Tulsa. My, uh, my dad still lives up there. My sister and my aunt live up there. The last few years of her life, she wa her health wasn't, wasn't really good and to the point where she had to move out of, out, of, out of my mom and dad's house that they had lived in for, for years. They built it. It was their dream home. And she had to move into a... Um, a SNF, it's called a skilled nursing facility. So it's not assisted living, it's not a nursing home, it's just this area where they can get better daily medical care because she required some. And after living there for a little while, her health took a turn for the worse and she had to go to a hospital. And she went to a hospital and it was fine. It, the experience was fine. It wasn't fantastic, but it wasn't bad either. They nursed her back to health after almost a month. She went back to her skilled nursing facility and a week after she returned, um, her kidneys failed, and she had to go back to, uh, go back to the hospital. This time, my dad took her to St. Francis Hospital. St. Francis is a hospital. It was about a mile or two from, her, uh, from their house, and I was amazed at the experience um, that, he, that, that they had. I don't know if you know a lot about, about the healthcare industry, but, but hospitals particularly, doctors and nurses do this a lot. They butt heads a lot. They don't get along, and doctors and staff do, do as well, but it didn't happen at St. Francis. They, the way they spoke to each other was, I mean, literally, I could tell the difference. Um, the way, there was one nurse in particular, her name was Megan. The way she took care of my dad, my dad was losing his partner of almost 60 years. They made it to, almost to the day, 59 years and six months. Almost 60 years they were together. And so the way that she took care of my dad was amazing. And most importantly, the way she took care of my mom. And my mom didn't even know she was being taken care of. It was it was, a, it, it was a beautiful is what it was. And I, it's a, I was in a weird place because here I am, I'm, I'm losing my mom and I was kind of a wreck about that. But then I also do this people thing and I was like, what's going on here? Why is this different? 
what's, what's making St. Francis different than the other hospital that we are in? And I did what anybody would do when, you're solved, when you have a problem. I hit the Google button on my internet machine. And I went to the St. Francis uh, website and I found one of their values. And their value was dignity. And they defined it like this respecting each person as an inherently valuable member of the human community and as a unique expression of life. It's a beautiful term. It's such a warm term. Anybody from HR here? Human resources? Human? Okay, this is one of those things where I'm probably going to don't fill out the survey at the end, right, because you're not going to give me a good, a good score on this one. I can't stand the term human resources. I don't like it. And the only thing worse than human resources is the trendier human capital, right? No, it's true. We're, it's, we're people, right? I would much rather be called the people department. Um, I told this story. I told this story last time. You know, you, so you have human capital, and then you and then you talk about retention policies, and now you're talking like this. We have a plan to retain our humans. That's <laughs> ridiculous. You know, I, we don't talk like that in life. I've made it. I've, as we've established earlier, I've made it for twenty three years plus twenty seven. All right, I've made it for 30 years, and at my 30th an uh, anniversary, my wife and I went out to dinner. And we went to a really nice steak restaurant, and it was, I mean, dark paneling on the walls and heavy table and white tablecloths, and all the servers were dressed in, you know, black pants and a white shirt and a black tie, and, you know, they had a candle and everything. Not a, and I'm telling you, this was a nice restaurant, not that little flickering light. It was a real candle, okay? <laughs> and can you imagine had I said, we sat there together, you know, and we, and we popped open our wine, and we were about to clink our glasses, and, you know, and, the, and my wife is beautiful as, as the, 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 the candlelight is flickering off her face. And I say, honey, I love you, and I have a plan to retain you for one more year. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, we wouldn't have gone to 32 or 31 or 32. It's crazy. Now, you can say that this, well, you know something, the way that reason that St. Francis used dignity is because that, that warm, that warm uh, uh, term is because they're a hospital. Well, the other hospital was a hospital, and it didn't. Well, that's kind of a, you know, that's a term that's it's kind of faith-based dignity, right? And it's St. Francis. Well, the other one was a saint something as well. This hospital chose to view people as unique and special. And if... It, all these five steps that we're going to talk about today, they're all five important, but it starts with V. It starts with, view, with deliberately choosing to look at people as unique and special, and everybody is special. There's an organization called OC Tanner, which helps companies do uh, value employee or uh, recognize employees. So they do, you know, tenure, you know, five, 10, 15 year tenure pins and, and sales awards, things like that. And they have an institute that studies uh, employee appreciation and recognition and the director, a guy named Kevin Ames, I heard him speak once and he said this. He goes, inside each individual are the seeds of greatness. And an organization's job, an organization's responsibility is to build a culture or an environment where those seeds can bloom. It's great. I would say the same thing for a leader. It's not just an organization. It's not just the company's job to do that. It's also a responsibility of a leader. Inside everybody on your team, are, there's, there are seeds of greatness inside each one of those people. And your job as a leader is to build that environment where those teams or where those people can bloom and do their best work. Uh, there's another, one other example, and I can find more, but I love this example of McAfee. McAfee is a software company. I like what they do. They've got great values, right? They say that we, are, we put our customer first. And, but in the very middle, they say, with our people at our heart, we're McAfee. Right? So they use a great term, they, and they show it graphically. I mean, they put their people in the middle of their values. They chose, they chose deliberately to do that. You know, the, the companies that choose, and again, I hope, I, I, I don't know what you guys say here, but people who say our employees are our greatest asset, I don't like, the, you, you probably think I'm a really hateful person because I don't like a lot of things, but I don't like that term because I'm, this is an asset. Th this is an asset. This building is an, is an asset. We're not assets. We're people. We have, that we, have, we have emotions and we have desires and career goals and families to support. It's a well-meaning phrase, I understand, but, it, but I think it just misses the mark a little bit. Oh, I wish we could stay here longer. I wish we could stay longer, but we need to move on. Valuing people, choosing to look at people is the first step 
in, in building a culture where people are valued in your own personal muscles. Number two is assisting in, 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 uh, in small ways, assisting people. And we're not going to spend much time here because, again, this is also a very simple concept. It requires us to be observant. Look at this picture. That's kind of, it's kind of hard to see if you're in the back, but that little boy, the, the, the brother or the friend, now I would say that's actually a very big thing that he's doing, right? It's not a, it's, that's not a little assist, that's a big assist for him. But he valued his brother or his friend enough to where he's going to go down and do the dirty work and let his friend get up there on top. Here's one that I personally experienced about a year and a half ago at a hotel. I came back after making a presentation and I found my toiletries like that. Now, would I have thought anything about my toiletries or would I thought anything less about my hotel had I come back and they would have all just been shoved in the corner? Absolutely not. No. But when I saw that, I felt, I felt a little warm inside. Like that housekeeper cared. I don't know why she cared, why she did that. And look at what she did. It's not only that they were lined up. I mean, all the labels are facing up straight, right? <laughs> now, it cost, it cost the company nothing to do that, except it maybe cost her 30 seconds of time. And I don't know why she did. Did she value me as just a traveler on the road away from home? Maybe. Did they just have a really good training department and they believed in customer service? Maybe. Either she valued me as a, as a I almost said as a human. <laughs> she valued me as a person or she, as a traveler or she valued me as a customer. It doesn't make a difference. Either way, she took the time, that little extra effort, to arrange my toiletries like that. And if we're observant, you start seeing people do this. And, if, and, and we need to transfer that where we're observant. How can we do that? I, anybody ever heard of the Broadmoor Hotel, Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs? It's a great place. And it's, um, uh, we, we're, we're there sometimes with, our, with some friends. And uh, we were in, the, in, a, in a restaurant bar that looked over the, over the, the, the grounds. And a family comes in. And we're just, you know, we're talking, having a good time. And a family comes in, and mom and dad, and two little girls, seven, eight years old. And, and shortly after sitting down and having all the, the water served to him, one of the little girls knocks over the water glass, and water went everywhere. And she almost instantly burst into tears. You know, and the parents did great. They were just cleaning it up. And, the, and the, she was either the server or the manager of the restaurant. She came running over, and she goes, oh, that's okay. And she kind of bent down on her level, and she took some napkins and started cleaning them. She goes, it's okay. No, it's all right. We'll, we'll clean it up. It's just water. And then, she, and then she started to walk away. And literally, it's like you could see the thought bubble out of her head. She stopped. And she turned around and she went back to the little girl and she goes, how would free french fries work for you? Would that make it better? What did, what did that cost the Broadmoor Resort? 32 cents, right? Who knows what? Nothing. But yet that little girl got a smile on her face. And here I am talking about it 10 years later. Nothing ever bad comes out of helping people and building a culture where people are valued. What are you doing? To, to, are you looking for ways to value people? Um, start doing that. Start putting on those, those, gla those lenses of how can, where can I help somebody? Let's listen to Tom Peters talk about helping people with the small things. Small things. Let's move on. If I, again, if I could spell a word with, with, with listening, be the L being the second letter, I would, because I, 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 love, I love all five steps, but I'd say listening is right behind viewing people, that, that mindset. And it's not about listening on a scale of 1 to 10, even though that's important. In fact, think about it, rate your, you, know, you don't have to tell anybody, but I mean, in, in, your own, in your own mind, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being low, 10 being high, rate yourself as a listener. Rate yourself as a listener. Turn to the person and tell you what your score was. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I just told you. No, that's just for you. But what I would say is this. If you're brave, now that you've rated yourself, if you're brave, go back to your team. And this is really true if you're, if you're a leader, if you're a manager. Go back to your team and ask your team, how good of a listener am I? Now, de depending on your relationship, you're going to get your bonus. I'm not going to give you overtime, right? You might have to kind of coax, but say, I really want to know. I did this for a, a, a manufacturer. I was doing a series of, of workshops for a manufacturer and I was going around to the six plants they had every single month. We talked about communication. I gave that challenge. I came back a month later and one of the uh, guys from the leadership team came up and he said, you know something, I'm really glad you made me do that because I gave myself an eight uh, and my team gave me a two. <laughs> you know, and, and so, and it was just okay and he took, he just, it was just a blind spot for him. He just didn't realize he was a bad listener. 
And so he took the steps to try and correct that. So I, I would challenge you to do that. Rate yourself and then go and ask for an opinion. Um, but it's not about a scale of 1 to 10. It's also about are you willing to be influenced. Remember I said earlier we're going to feel uncomfortable. Here we go. This is one of those times. Um, I have two or three core beliefs that I won't change. Nothing anybody can make me change. For example, my belief in God and my relationship with God, nobody will change that core belief. Nobody. How I live my faith out, some days I do it well, some days I don't, that's up for, for discussion for sure. But, but that core belief, and, and outside of those two or three core beliefs, um, I need to be willing to, to, uh, to have an open mind. That's one of the problems with society today. We're not willing to listen with an open mind. For example, the term white privilege. I don't know what it was about this talk, about that term, but, but I've done some investigation. Because when I first heard the term, I thought it was made up. I, don't, I just thought it was a political agenda. I don't know if anybody's noticed here, but I'm an old white man, okay? And there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing I can do about it. I get older by the day. And, and so for whatever reason, I just thought that, that I didn't think in that term was a real term. But I, but I started to investigate and, and, and explore. And by investigating and explore, I mean I talked to my black friends. I talked to my Hispanic friends. And I talked to my Asian friends. And I talked to white, my white friends. And we started talking about this thing called white privilege. And this is where I am today. I can tell you that I have never thought about my skin color. Ever. Never had to. But if we're watching the news, if, if we're together or if we're by ourselves, if we're at happy hour and the TV and the, the monitor's up there, if we're at baggage claim at, at Intercontinental and they're showing CNN, or if we're by ourselves in our house and we're watching Fox or CNN or CNB, whatever, and a story comes on about a police officer shooting a black man and you're a black man or even a black woman, you can't help but think about your skin color, right? Is that white privilege? The fact that I have never had to expend any energy on, on my skin color. And instead I've thought about how can I make a sale? How can, I how can I improve my lot in life? Is that white privilege that I've never had any energy on that? And as a black man at some point, especially today, you have to? I don't know if that's what white privilege is. I don't know. Because I'm still evolving there. But the point is this. I have. And it, we, we, we need to have these discussions. These are hard discussions. But we need to have them. If we're only going to have them well if we're willing to open up our minds and listen. Now, sometimes we may end up dis agreeing to disagree. I used to hate that term. I actually, now I love that term. And that's okay. So think about this for yourselves. What are those two or three or maybe four core beliefs that you have that nobody's going to change? And that's okay. But outside of those two or three or four, I challenge you to open up and listen. And when I say listen, I'm talking about don't just listen to people's words. Listen to their hearts. Listen to their stories. And my bet is that, that you'll change. You'll be influenced. Maybe not every time. Maybe not every time. But sometimes we will. And if we do that well enough, our, 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 we will build a culture here. I actually believe if we did that well enough, it, it would lead to world peace. I used to start my presentation off that way, and then I would lose too many people. Like, really? He's talking about world peace? I am, I am checking out of this guy. Again, I'm, I'm a realist. I know that'll never happen. But, I mean, that's how important it is. If we all just opened up and listened, life would be so much better. Let's move on. Oh, important. Whew, okay, everybody okay? See, I told you we were going to come out okay. I told you we would. I told you we would. Here's another one. Oh, I'm sorry, Lolly uh, uh, Daskal, she said this, great quote. She goes, listen without defending, speak without offending. She's an author, written a couple of books. You know, when, listen and don't defend. You know, as you're having those hard conversations, don't defend your beliefs, just listen. And then when you speak, don't offend, don't use offensive language. I worked with, there's an organization called Interaction Associates. They're a, they're a, a boutique kind of like training firm. And I worked with one of their consultants one time, his name was Jay Cohn, and he said this, Listen as an ally. Listen as an ally. I think that's a great, a great sentiment to have. Now, when you do your survey about was the speaker good, I better get some points just because I have puppies and kittens <laughs> on my presentation, okay? Here's the fourth one. Understanding our similarities so we can, we can talk about our differences. 
There's more to put us together than, uh, than, than divide us. Uh, Crystal, can I pick on, not pick, can, I, can I ask you a few questions? Okay. I need to, we need to have a serious conversation, but before we do, let's, let's, let's see if we're connected. Uh, so I'm going to ask you some questions and you just answer them. Are you a human? Are you a, per, are you a, are you a, are you a people? Yes. yes, you are. Yes. Are you breathing? Yes. Look at it. Two questions, two connections. Um, Italian or Mexican food? Favorite. Mexican. Oh. Tex, Tex okay, good. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's blow it up. I don't this like no, the mole. Blow it up. Okay, blow it up. Okay. Um, mountains or beaches? I like do beach. I have kids or no kids with you? Oh, <laughs> great point. She goes, do I have kids or no kids with me? Great point. Uh, kids. Okay, beaches. Beaches. Okay. We, I, you know, it's not, it's not I don't like beaches. I just like mounds better. So let's just do a little tap. Just, there we go, a little tap. Okay. Uh, do, you like, do you like sports? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Favorite, like, you like football? I'll watch it. I'm not going to play football. No, no, I know. Yeah, but, you're, <laughs> but, yeah, but, you're, but, you, but you like to watch it, yeah? yeah. Favorite team? Oh, the Texans. Um, <laughs> no, it's, we, because we both like football, we can still, we can still knuckle bone, okay? Um, let's see, what else? Plain or peanut M&Ms? Plain, for sure. Plain for sure? Watch this. <laughs> uh, hmm? Yeah? Here, I got a shareable bag, too, so there you go. Okay? I can't make her share you guys, it's only, right? In 30 seconds, we've connected on five, six different things. And if we kept on going, we could see how we connected. Now I'm gonna, let's, let's get out into deeper waters. Now you don't have to, you don't, again, don't feel like, if you wanna pass, just say pass. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, politically, would you say you lean more conservative or liberal? Uh, you know where I stand spiritually, right? So are you, you're more spiritual than, all right? Okay. It wouldn't have made a difference that she said liberal and, and unreligious. Why? We're, that, really, and those are two serious topics and we are, we are on opposite sides. Can we talk? Yes, we can. But we're going to talk while we watch the Texans versus the Cowboys well, on the beach <laughs> sharing M&Ms. And our spouses will be there, so please, it's all safe, okay? We're all safe. If we connect first on those things, we don't need to jump into people and say, gee, I don't, I, don't, I don't like you. I don't believe in what you believe, so therefore we can't be friends. It's crazy. Uh, Cap, I just read this article a few weeks ago. Captain America, Chris Evans, the actor for Captain America, he just came out and he says he can no longer be friends with Tom Brady because he supports Trump. So now we're choosing our friends based on how they vote. That's crazy. We can't do that. We need to have a discussion about why did you vote for Trump or why did you vote for Hillary and who are you going to vote for next time. We need to have those discussions, but we've got to do it in a constructive way. And we do that by sharing M&Ms as we watch sports or whatever those connections happen to be. Brene Brown puts it this way. Brene Brown, great author, great books. If you haven't read, or read some of her books, please do. She goes this. She just says this. People are hard to hate close up, so move in. Right? That's a, such a great sentiment. A hundred or a hundred and fifty years earlier, I, I needed to do better on my, on my U.S. history. Abraham Lincoln said this. Abraham Lincoln said, I don't like that man. I need to get to know him better. Isn't that a great sentiment? That's awesome. Connecting on similarities. We've covered a lot of ground in just a few minutes, and I wish we could go into each one of them more deeply, but we're talking about viewing people as important. We're talking about um, assisting people in small ways. We're talking about listening with this idea of being influenced. We've talked about um, connecting on similarities so we can talk about those differences. And the last one is this. It's explain. Tell somebody how, how they're valued. Now, I know we're, 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 we've got a little bit more time. Look, I, I, was, I was told some people will need to go. If you need to go, it gets better. No, I'm kidding. If you need, if you need, to, go, if you need to go, I understand that. Uh, please go. But we're, we've got another about 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, then we'll wrap up. I want you to, want you to do this. Uh, think about somebody on your team that needs to be valued. And if you're a supervisor, I, I, I'm going to challenge you to just needs to be somebody who, who reports to you. 
And I want you, pull out your phones or on a piece of paper, but I want you to schedule a time of when you're going to value that person, when you're going to tell them that they're valued. I can't make you do this. I can't make you do this, but I'm, 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 I know that I know that I know when you do this, you'll be, you'll be probably more blessed than the person that you're, you're, that you're giving it to. So pull out your phones or on a piece of paper, and I want you to schedule a time. Next Wednesday at lunch, I'm taking out somebody from my team, and I'm gonna tell, that's when I'm going to tell them why they're valued. It's not love. Love is important. I, think, I don't think unless you, unless you love people, you can be a good, effective manager. And not the squishy, emotional marriage love. I'm just saying like the, the love of people and wanting the best for them. I'm not talking about appreciation. Appreciation is important. It's nuance. It's valuing people. It's valuing the person for who they are and what they bring to the table. That's what we're talking about. Just, you appreciate the activities that they do every day, but you value them for who they are. And so my challenge to you is to do that, is to put it down on your calendar and be deliberate in who you do that with at work. But this is, more, this is bigger than work. This is bigger than work. What we're talking about here is life. And this is what I would like you to do. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to join you. I'm going to do this with you. If you have your phone, pull out your phone. And I want you to pick somebody out in your life who needs to hear from you that they're valued. Now listen, again, I can't make you do it, but, but there's a chance that you're going to, you'll really be blessed. I've heard, I've had funny different, different reactions. On one end of the spectrum, I've had, I've heard funny responses. I was giving this presentation to uh, the Oklahoma uh, State, the Oklahoma HR conference. And, uh, and we did this, and, and somebody started laughing, and I asked the lady what, what happened. She goes, well, I texted my husband, you know, honey, I love you, and I value you for everything that you do for the family. And he texted back. He said, uh, thank you. Are you cheating on me? <laughs> so I had to say to her, obviously, you're not telling your husband enough, so try more. But I've also had it on the, the pendulum was on the other side of her. I've had some really cool experiences. I had one woman come up to me afterwards, and she says, you know, I texted, my, uh, I texted my adult son why I valued him. And he wrote back, and he goes, Mom, I've never heard you say that. I can't make you do this. But I'm going to pause, literally, for like 30 or 45 seconds. And it will be weird. Whoever you're texting, say, look, I'm just listening to some guy talk, and he told me to send a text to somebody, and I chose you. I don't, you know, I don't, it doesn't be special. But, but do that, and I'm going to join you. I'm going to, so 30 seconds, 45 seconds, let's text somebody in your life that needs to hear from you that they're valued. I'll give you a few more seconds, and then if anybody gets a response, we'll, uh, we'll take a pause at the very end and see if anybody gets a reply. So let's wrap up. So now what? Nothing I said here was probably earth-shattering. I understand that. And when, I, when I teach leadership, I say the same thing. Like I say, if you've, if you've come here looking for this epiphany or this aha, you'll probably leave disappointed because there's nothing new under the good leadership sun. I mean, what was, what's a good, a good leader today was a good leader 50 years ago. And so the same thing here. This, isn't, this is not anything earth-shattering that I told you. But I have, I think, I, hopefully I've put these thoughts in together in a way that you haven't experienced before. So you're different now than you were when you walked in. So what do you do? What do you do with all this? Dennis, uh, uh, author and, and radio commentator Dennis Prager says this. He goes, good folks don't fight. They want to spend their time with their family, with their job, with their community, and with their friends. Good people just want to be left alone, but they need to fight. If we're going to keep incivility at bay here and not let it enter into our walls, and we're going to have these conversations that we need to have, we have to fight. It's not going to just happen. It won't just happen. We have to be willing to enter into the game and put some effort into some of this. That's why my, I really am passionate about this message, and I'm trying to give it as much as I possibly can. 
Because I think it's a message that we need to start, we, we need to hear more and we need to start sending more text messages like that to our people. Tom Peters, again, our friend Tom says this, he goes, it starts with an unyielding, fanatical, one hour at a time commitment to no less than excellence ever. Now he's talking about excellence there, but the reason I include that is because Tom uses really strong words. He talks about radical and fanatical and exhaustive and deliberate. And that's how, that's how cultures are built. Cultures don't just happen. They take effort. They take a hard effort. Another author said this. Oh, look at that. It was me. I said this. Um, you may not be able to change the world, but you can change somebody's world. So value every interaction with every person that you come in touch with. Value, value your neighbor, your family, um, the, the barista at Starbucks. When you're going down 59 and, and, and somebody's trying to merge in, let off the accelerator. Don't hit it. And I know you do. <laughs> right? We all do. We hit the accelerator. Value that person as a human just trying to get through life and trying to get to work and back off the accelerator a little bit. Tom Peters, one more time. In a world of uh, giving speeches about management, there is one quite lovely quote that is so overused that I find it nauseating that anybody would ever use it again, and so I'm about to use it again. It is a Gandhi line, and it says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. If you've got a giant campaign going on relative to improve quality and everything from tie in your shoes to the way your office looks or what have you, even though I'm hardly a neat freak myself, has got to echo and or magnify the quote unquote policy message you are trying to sell. Uh, if you look scared of your shadow and you're trying to sell innovation, forget about it. Uh, there's, there's another phrase that is not so elegant as Mr. Gandhi, but I love it. It uh, comes from a consultant and I don't even remember what his name is anymore. But his point is, and boy, is this true. He says, it's always showtime. A manager is leading people. You lead by example. Uh, and what that means is 24-7, or at least the 18-6 that many people are at work, you must, in fact, understand that you're putting on a show. I mean, there's substance there, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, people are all, to go back to the old Cold War analogy, people are all Kremlinologists. They dissect what you're wearing and who you're talking to and the way you present yourself and the kinds of questions you ask and so on. Uh, years ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt f famously said, the president must be the nation's number one actor. Well, Mr. Roosevelt is clearly right, but the same thing is true for a 26-year-old first-line supervisor working with eight or ten men and women on a job. It is, if you're a leader, if you're a boss, it is always showtime. Always showtime. Are you willing to put the effort in to build a culture here and to build your own personal value others muscles? So now what? Um, you know something, we've got a, a couple of minutes. Can we do this at your tables? Just, I'm going to give you maybe one or two minutes. I've said some things um, that maybe you've thought of, maybe you haven't. What stood out? What was meaningful today? I want you to, I'm going to give you maybe one or two minutes, and then I've got one more slide after that, and then uh, we'll wrap up. So at your tables, just talk about anything stand out, anything mean something to you, and then, uh, then we'll move on. About one or two minutes. Two, one. All right, come back. Sounds like it was a good discussion. I wish we could continue. Uh, I hope you do continue. In fact, Brene Brown says this. She goes, organizations really have to start having these conversations inside their four walls if they want to, to attract and keep the best talent. So hopefully this is not the only time that you're going to have this discussion. Hopefully, hopefully you, and, and I think you do could because you have, I was telling uh, Mickey that, you know, that Grow has been around for 10 years. You guys were really progressive. You were having a women's group 10 years ago because not many companies were, so congratulations to you. But my, my challenge to you is to do the things that build your own personal value others muscles. Do what it takes to build a value other muscles here as your culture. And to the extent that you can start having these difficult conversations, we're having them. 
we're having these conversations outside of these walls, and sometimes we have them inside these walls. Point is, we want to make sure that we have them well. Okay? Anybody receive a text back, by the way? Oh. Can you share? Oh. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> That's good. Anybody else? Any other res responses? Yes, ma'am. So I sent a message to my daughter and I said, I'm in a class and we uh, were told we need to text someone and tell them why we value them. I said, I value you because you're an amazing daughter and you make me extremely proud. And she texted that, oh, thanks, Mom. I value you as well. There isn't another woman I would want to have to be my mother. Thank you for being such a good role model and example. That's awesome. That is awesome. That deserves a round of applause. Let's see, I got a response from my friend Kurt. I said, uh, uh, I said Kurt, I value, simple, I value you simply for your friendship. I'm truly blessed to count you as a friend. His response, how nice of you, friend. I value your hair and your humor in that order. So he knows I'm a funny guy too, right? So there we go. Any other responses? Anybody else? You might get some throughout the day. Who knows? Right? I, I, that, thank you for sharing. That's, that's awesome, both of you. Last story. We're going we're gonna to bring this in for a landing. My last story. Sometimes valuing people takes courage. Sometimes, you know, some people do. I mentioned this earlier. Some people do it better than others. And I, I was in that camp. I, I, th I, I think and I thought that I was already pretty good at valuing others. But I realized um, that I can do better. And what made me realize that was in uh, Italy. My wife and I, when we celebrated that 30th anniversary, we had a wonderful trip in, in Italy. And at one point towards the end, we found ourselves in Florence. And we were having a wonderful dinner. And it was, I mean, we had wine and the biggest steak I'd ever had and dessert and after dinner drinks. I mean, at one point I said to the server, I said, no moss. And that's not even Italian, right? I mean, like, <laughs> but I said, I said stop. And we were really full, and then the server brought, our server brought over a dessert to the table next to us, looking much like that picture. Um, and he, and he, he brought it over, and he brought two, one for his, the, the wife and the husband, I guess. And then he took a spoon, and he smashed it in the middle, and steam came up. And then he took this carafe, and he poured liquid gold chocolate into the middle. I mean, it was incredible. And we were all just, we couldn't eat anymore, but we were all, all four, we went with some friends, and we were staring at it. And I, and I was probably even drooling a little bit. And so the, the Italian gentleman, he picked it up, and he turned to my wife, and he offered her a bite. I was blown away. Right? I don't know. I mean, again, I don't know what he was thinking, but he, obviously he valued us to the point of, I, I don't know, he knew we weren't from there, right? I, so I, I, he wanted us to have a good time in Florence or a good time in Italy or, or just taste this, whatever it was that drew, made him do it. He, a complete stranger offered us a bite of his dessert. And here I am thinking, I'm doing a pretty good job when I back off the accelerator. <laughs> we can do better. We can do better. So I, I hope what we've said today, or what, I, what we've talked about today, has been inspiring. I hope it makes you think a little bit differently. How do you view people? Um, I hope some of the steps we talked about are, are, are deliberate enough or, or practical enough where you can start implementing when you walk out the door. Um, I, and thanks for, your, thanks for laughing, even when it wasn't funny. Uh, I look forward to coming back in a few months. So thanks and have a great day, everybody. All right, real quick. Uh, thank you, Darren, again. I wish you the best in your three years of marriage and your 30 <laughs> kids that you have <laughs> there. But uh, I hope I make we'll it to number four. Next yeah, time right. for it. Uh, also, if you guys will <clears throat> help me in, in thanking the people and the volunteers that put this together, a lot goes into this. So if you can give them a round of a hand. Uh, uh, we also just want to make sure on behalf of GROW that uh, you guys continue to be engaged and participating in these events, uh, that you also look for some of these volunteer opportunities, uh, because engagement and awareness at all levels in this company is vital to our success. So we're always looking for feedback um, and ideas on future quality events, and we're also looking for uh, people who do want to look for some opportunities to, to volunteer. 
So if you have any of those uh, ideas or concerns, please get with us after this. Uh, but other than that, have a safe remaining day and have a, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks for letting me pick on you a little bit, too. Yeah, no, yeah. No, that was, I didn't dude, even catch you. Dude, it was, was perfect. That was perfect. Yeah.